Well, warmest welcome to everyone. Uh, as Notre Dame's first president, Father Edward Soren, chose October 13th, the feast of St. Edward the Confessor, as Founder's Day, a day to commemorate and give thanks for the many blessings God has bes had bestowed on Notre Dame. Ever since Father Soren began celebrating Founder's Day many years ago, this day has been an opportunity for the campus community to gather together and remember Notre Dame's history. Father Soren and the early Holy Cross priests and brothers had the vision to know that Notre Dame would be a powerful means for good in this country, and they had the tenacity to make sure it would become a reality. And for over 175 years, Notre Dame has served generations of students as well as the local community and the wider world. Father Soren wanted Founders Day to be a celebration of all that we have achieved in a remembrance of where we came from in, as an institution and also an inspiration for our future. I hope today serves those purposes. And it is now my tremendous pleasure to introduce and, uh, and for the Charles and Jill Fisher Provost, Marilyn Miranda, who will introduce tonight's distinguished speaker. Marilyn. Thank you, Father John. Thank you and welcome to all of you to the 2021 Founders Day keynote public lecture. What a pleasure to be with all of you this evening. And uh, it's a special pleasure for me to actually be in a room with people uh, to really learn Notre Dame, which is uh, I feel like I'm finally getting the Notre Dame experience this year. So thank you all for coming. So founders are this year, in Founders Day, we are choosing to celebrate John Zahm, and John Zahm has a special place in the history of Notre Dame, um, particularly related to his role in advancing Notre Dame's work in science. Now, I myself have a soft spot in my heart for Father Augustus Limonier, uh, who served as president of the university from 1872 to 1874. His, presidently, his presidency cut short by his untimely death at the age of 35. He also happened to be the nephew of Father Soren. Um, at the beginning of his presidency, Père Lemonnier increased the mathematics and science requirements in what was then called the classical or collegiate course of study, adding botany, geology, and physics to the existing human physiology and chemistry requirements. He also inaugurated for the first time an engineering course of study in 1873, the first such program in any American Catholic university. For those of you familiar with the main building, you are aware that portraits of all of Notre Dame's presidents hang on the walls. Just outside the provost's office is in fact the, por the portrait of Père de Monnier. So he reminds me every morning when I come in and every evening when I leave of the importance of science and its full consonance with our Catholic faith. In many ways, Père Le Monnier set the stage for the work of Father Zahm. Father Zahm was the consummate scientist. He liked to put his ideas out in the public realm and then invite critique, invite conversation. He could battle with the best, but like most good scientists, viewed the battle as a way to sharpen his ideas. That willingness to battle got him into trouble from time to time. Um, but nevertheless, he, you know, he had a particular way of being in the world. It is, of course, interesting then that although he welcomed public discourse on his ideas, in 1913, he published Woman in Science under an anagrammatic pen name, H.J. Mozans. So if you take John Zahm and mix up the letters, you get H.J. Mozans. The book was a chronicle of women's contribution to scientific scholarship from the medieval period through to the early 20th century. The story of women scientists at Catholic universities such as Salerno and Bologna, Zahm believed, provided a powerful rebuttal, quote, to those who insist on women's incapacity for scientific pursuits, unquote. Looking ahead, Zahm predicted that, quote, women's long struggle, struggle for complete intellectual freedom is almost ended and certain victory is already in sight. We can imagine Father Zahm smiling as we welcome Sister Damien Marie Savino, a scholar, scientist, and woman of deep faith to the university he did so much to transform. 
a Franciscan sister of the Eucharist. Sister Damian Marie has served as the Dean of Science and Sustainability at Aquinas College in Grand Rapids, Michigan since 2016, a uh, college that I had the good fortune to visit uh, some number of years ago. In this position, she oversees the biology, chemistry, physics, geography, and environmental studies departments, and the college's Center for Sustainability. Sister Damien Marie received her Bachelor of Science in Biogeography from McGill University and her Master of Science in Soil and Plant Science from the University of Connecticut. She earned both her Master's of Arts in Theology and her Doctoral Degree in Civil Engineering from the Catholic University of America. Her scientific research focuses, focuses on environmental redi remediation of soil and groundwater contamination, the environmental impacts of endocrine disrupting chemicals, something that you and I have in common, and the application of resilience theory to ecosystem health. For the past 10 years, she has become increasingly involved in interdisciplinary projects and has lectured and written widely on Laudato Si and integral ecology as well as on science and faith, ecology and theology, and ecological restoration and health. Sister Damien Marie is no stranger to Notre Dame, for which we are grateful. She regularly visits the sustainability class taught jointly by professors Phil Sakimoto uh, and Laura Walls, and collaborates with Professor Sakimoto on a presentation and workshop they call Banana peels and climate change. I myself am more hoping that I get to learn more about banana peels and climate change. She is also an informal consultant on diverting the campus waste stream from landfills. Sister Damien Marie, welcome back to Notre Dame, and thank you for being with us to celebrate Founders Day and using Father Zahm's work as a springboard to explore the relationship between faith and science. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. And happy Founders Day, I should say, to all of you. It's an honor to be here with you this evening. I always enjoy coming to Notre Dame. I would like to begin by thanking all who initiated and, and organized this lecture. First, my gratitude to Father Jenkins and his office for sponsoring the lecture, and to all who worked assiduously on the logistics and promotion of it. My thanks also to the members of the Founders Day Committee, as well as the Kushwa Center for the Study of American Catholicism, and especially to Dr. Kathleen Cummings, who has coordinated many of the details of the lecture. And it's really a delight to meet you after so many months emailing back and forth. I'm grateful, too, also for the connection of this lecture to the 2021-2022 Notre Dame Forum which is focusing this year on the theme of care for our common home and the just transition to a sustainable future. What an important mission for a Catholic university and one that's very near and dear to my own heart. So again, it's a joy to be here with you and to be able to celebrate with you this evening. The Founders Day Committee asked if I would focus on how Father Zahm's um, legacy speaks to science and religion conversations today in general, and then in particular, how his work could inform contemporary Catholic approaches to sustainability. So I think I should begin with a bit of a disclaimer, because I'm sure there's some experts on Father Zahm in the audience, and there surely will be tomorrow on the panels. I'm not an expert on his work, but I am excited to use his work as a springboard for my comments. And I think one of the unexpected graces of preparing this lecture has been the opportunity to read some of Father Zahm's writings. Dr. Cummings sent me uh, his book, A Woman in Science, and John Slattery's excellent book on Father Zahm's legacy in science and faith. And then I was, my interest was piqued, so then I got the, a copy of Father Zahm's book, Evolution and Dogma. And I'll be using that tonight in my lecture primarily. I was quite taken with Father Zahm's approach to faith and science his, his sensitivity also in recognizing, at the turn of the 20th century, the particular contributions of women and the giftedness they can bring to the study of science, and his approaches to questions of evolution and faith. I found myself, I said this at dinner, I found myself wishing that I could meet him in person. 
Uh, I think we would have really enjoyed some conversations and maybe even some hikes together. I understand he enjoyed the outdoors as well. So I thank you for the unexpected fruit of, for, for me of this lecture, and I hope that uh, now I can bring some fruits to all of you. So this is what I will cover tonight. First, consider briefly the founding legacy of Father Zahm in relation to questions of science and faith, and evolution in particular. Then I will touch on the implications of this for contemporary dialogues in science and faith, and then in more depth on the implications of his legacy for Catholic approaches to sustainability, especially in light of Laudato Si. And finally, I will close with a reflection on some potential trajectories for future work and collaboration. The word to found comes from the Latin fundare, to lay the bottom or basis of something. Think of the foundation of a building. And I like that image because it gives the sense of a founder as authoring life from beneath. So, because the foundation supports from below the building that rises on top of it. And a solid foundation is really essential, like the wise man in Christ's parable who built his house on rock. We can also contrast founding with its opposite, confounding, or the confusing of things, making the waters muddy, as it were. I would say the Catholic foundations laid down by Father Zahm, which were building upon 2,000 years of Catholic foundations, were clarifying. They were offered in a time when the waters were muddy in relation to how to understand evolutionary theory and Catholic faith. His contributions didn't obfuscate, but they made clearer the proper relationship between faith and science. So first, by way of introduction, there were three points about his life that seemed to be central to me, to his founding call. First, his conviction in union with Father Zorin to make Notre Dame a great Catholic university, a community not only of scholars formed in the spirit of academic rigor, but also of saints. Second, his, his dawning recognition of a particular mission to faith and science, which included his dedication to advocating for a really robust science curriculum that continues at Notre Dame to this day. He himself was a chemistry and physics professor at Notre Dame, and he made his own personal contributions to scientific inquiry. And then finally, most pertinent to my comments this evening, his deepening understanding of evolutionary theory as a, ma a manifestation of the mutual relationship between faith and science. And so in Father Zahm's words, which were written in 1896, not that long after Darwin's treatises, which were published in 1859 and 1871, and Zah Father Zahm writes, when viewed in the light of Christian philosophy and theology, there is much in evolution to admire much that is ennobling and inspiring, much that throws new light on the mysteries of creation, much in fine that makes the whole circle of the sciences tend as never before, ad maiorum dei gloriam. Ennobling is such a beautiful term, and Darwin himself used it as well, and their use of it inspired my title of the lecture this evening. The word noble, actually has its origins in notiore, meaning to come to know. And so the more deeply we know something or someone in their integrity, the more we ennoble that piece of reality or that, that relationship. So it's not only that evolution doesn't conflict with our faith, but says Zahm, it's even more than that, it actually ennobles our faith. Evolution makes the created world more reflective of the glory of God in Father Zahm's eyes. So how, in particular, did his work and writing serve to ennoble the science and religion dialogue? First of all, he's to be respected as a scientist. So in addition to his academic uh, pursuits, Father Zahm was an accomplished naturalist in his own right. He became a good friend and travel companion of Theodore Roosevelt, since they both had serious interests in natural history. But in thinking about how Father Zahm's legacy could inform the science-religion dialogue, I thought that maybe one way to frame it is to think of his contributions in what, what I decided to call Catholic with a small C and Catholic with a capital C foundations. 
small c, not, not that it's less important necessarily, but that it is a foundational approach or, or method that is kind of universal and dialogical. And capital C in the sense of foundational content or, or dogma. So to begin with the small c Catholic foundations, three important aspects when we think of the word Catholic with a small c. First of all, universal. And I think as you heard from the wonderful inf introduction from the provost, Zahm, Father Zahm was free to engage with all, and he did this in his whole life. Many wide-ranging interests also in science, as well as, for example, in Dante. And I know that you have exhibits from his Dante collection here during the Founders' Day celebrations. Relational, so we believe in a Trinitarian God that is fundamentally relational. And so this belief should change or model how we relate to one another and to the created world. And Father Zahm was an example of that. He seemed to have a great capacity for relationship. Think of his special relationship with President Roosevelt, his many connections across the world, and his acknowledgment of the value of relating to women in his book, Woman in Science. And this posture of universality and relationality is the foundation for true dialogue. This is a screenshot of one of the pages of the table of contents of evolution and dogma in the first part in which he addresses the science, showing that Father Zahm wasn't afraid, like, like Aquinas, to relate to all who are experts, including secular experts and those with whom we disagree. It was almost dizzying reading through his analysis of the many theories and writers who engaged with questions of evolution in his day. Now on to the capital C, uh, Catholic foundations. And these are, if you think of them like outstanding signposts or spires that give you vision on the skyline and help you navigate your way around, like the Basilica of the Sacred Heart or the Notre Dame Dome. And here I would like to highlight three key principles from Father Zahm's work on evolution and dogma. First, the distinction between creation and nature, which he makes very clearly. The notion of secondary causes and the idea that human persons have a unique nature and role in the created world. And if I might share a small personal comment, when I was reading Father Zahm's treatise on evolution and dogma, I was struck because some parts of it really were like reading my own class notes. <laughs> and, um, and in fact, I recently had a, a journal article published in Review for Religion in which I advocate teaching these exact principles as a strategy for the new evangelization. Of course, lest my head get too big over this, <laughs> Father Zahm articulated these some 125 years ago. <laughs> so he was truly prescient and, and ahead of his time. And they are perennial principles in Catholic theology and philosophy. But I am very glad to be in his companionship. And one final comment on this slide. I think we need both small c and capital C foundations as Catholics, especially today for the new evangelization. We live in a polarized world and we need to meet people in a spirit of dialogue and inclusiveness and build relationships in order for there to be an openness to receive the content or the dogma, the, the capital C foundations. So being Catholic with a small c and Catholic with a capital C is something to which we can all aspire if we wish to become Catholic saints and scholars as Fathers Zahm and Soren envisioned. So now the first principle, the distinction between creation, creation and nature, this grew out of Father Zahm's conviction that there's nothing in evolution which is contrary to church doctrine. And in responding to controversies over the question of evolution and design, Father Zahm went so far to state that evolution is the most reasonable view and the, most one, the one most in harmony with the explicit declarations of the Genesis narrative of creation. And further, he says, Darwin has neither eliminated the concept of creation nor that of design. On the contrary, he has ennobled both. And there's that beautiful ennobling term again. And then he says, Darwin does not remove teleology, but merely puts it farther back. So very cogent analysis. However you want to draw your evolutionary tree, and, and here are two contemporary examples on the slide, 
there is a teleological starting point which cannot be fully determined by scientific investigation, which precedes both the method and the results of science. Father Zahm decried the fact that the two terms creation and nature were often conflated in his day, as they are still today. He emphasizes that they refer to two different realities. So creation, in its strictest sense, is the production by God of something from nothing. The universe and all that it contains was called into existence, he says, ex nihilo, by an act of the creator. So God is the primary cause, the first cause, the cause of causes. Nature is what he calls secondary or derivative creation, referring to the world of matter, which is governed by scientific laws. So all things in nature have real existences, but they're limited in, in their duration and absolutely dependent upon God, the creator. They're, they're contingent. Father Zahm argues that we need to guard against the conflation of these two terms because it can lead us into serious error as Catholics. And one major reason that he expresses for his concern was that conflating the terms, which, which usually results in evading or eliminating the notion of creation, is an approach taken by those who want to deny the possibility of God. And indeed, this does continue to be a concern today. In fact, Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI expressed in a number of his writings his concerns about what he called the concealment of creation in contemporary discourse. And the second principle on the notion of secondary causes, and so Father Zahm writes, according to the fathers and the schoolmen, as well as according to Catholic dogma, God is the first cause, finite beings are secondary causes. And science is basically the study of secondary causes. The theory of evolution explains the coming into being of new species by the operation of secondary causes. And this design, says Father Zahm, is an ennobling design. To allow each creature its own proper causality is a higher manifestation of wisdom, he says, than if each creature was directly created by God. And here, Zahm echoes Darwin himself, who wrote, and I quote Darwin, to my mind, it accords better with what we know of laws impressed on matter by the creator that the production and extinction of the past and present inhabitants of the world should have been due to secondary causes. When I view all beings not as special creations, but as the lineal descendants of some few beings which lived long before, they seem to me to become ennobled. And then the third capital C principle, oh, sorry, I forgot about that. The unique nature of the human person. Father Zahm says the key principle is that while the human body came to be indirectly by the operation of secondary causes, according to the theory of evolution, God created the soul of humans directly. He writes, we simply admit for the body of man what we have, may have seen readily for the rest of the animate world, creation through the agency of secondary causes. But as to the soul of man, we can at once, <coughs> excuse me, emphatically declare that it in no wise evolved from the souls of animals, but is on the contrary, and in the case of each individual, directly and immediately created by God himself. And here he anticipates what St. John Paul II will say 100 years later in response to contemporary questions about evolution. He says the exact same thing, that evolution explains the evolution of the human body, but it cannot explain the soul, which is directly and immediately created by God for each person. And I think that both Father Zahm and St. John Paul II would agree that this in no way diminishes the power and transcendence of God. In fact, it ennobles both God and creation. <clears throat> now, if we can consider some contemporary implications of Father Zahm's founding legacy, I'd like to spend most of the remaining time on the implications for ecological questions but with this slide, I'll preface that with some broader comments on the contemporary implications for the science-faith dialogue. In this beautiful passage in, in Evangelii Gaudium, 
Pope Francis states that science can be a tool for the new evangelization. I believe this is very true, and in fact, um, recently wrote a chapter for the third volume of a series on the new evangelization, elaborating on this idea. The series is edited by your own John Cavadini. <laughs> the small c and capital C foundations laid down by Father Zahm can be instructive in terms of suggesting approaches and content for enlivening, or, or we might even say ennobling, the science-faith dialogue in our Catholic educational institutions. From a small c perspective, there's the pressing need to listen to others, to meet them where they are, and to dialogue, especially with science and with scientists, as an entrance point to evangelization. Begin with the science and allow it to lead us into deeper questions of faith and apologetics. This is what Father Zahm did in Evolution and Dogma and what Pope Francis does in Laudato Si. And I think we would do well to follow their examples. From a capital C perspective, those three principles, the distinction between creation and nature, the notion of secondary causes, and the unique nature and role of the human person are three guiding principles that we can and should incorporate in various ways into both science and theology curricula in our Catholic schools and universities. Now, for some thoughts on the contemporary implications of uh, Father Zahm's legacy for sustainability, especially in light of Pope Francis's encyclical on the environment, Laudato Si. Let's start with small C considerations. First, the Pope says in the introduction that it was written for the whole world, not just for Catholics, and that it drew upon the work of numerous scientists, philosophers, theologians, and civic groups around the world. And I uh, was told that Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew will be coming to Notre Dame in a couple of weeks to receive an honorary degree and address the campus. This is really amazing, and he's certainly one of the figures that Pope Francis mentions in the introduction in a very complimentary way about his work in faith and science and ecology. So I would say Laudato Si was written in a true spirit of universality because all people need to be engaged in environmental questions. Secondly, in the way the encyclical is, is even structured, the Pope exemplifies a spirit of small c dialogue between science and religion. Just as Father Zahm engaged with the primary scientific issue in his day, so does Laudato Si do the same. And Pope Francis deliberately begins with the science, as did Father Zahm in Evolution and Dogma. They both utilize science as an entrance point to dialogue. After the science comes the theology. For as the Pope says, science and theology can engage in an intense dialogue that's fruitful to both. And he shares in the chapter on theology his conviction that Catholic theology can contribute to ecology and the full development of humanity, and that Christians need to realize that their responsibility within creation and their duty towards nature and the creator are an essential part of their faith. Then in chapter three, he urges us to look within ourselves to the human roots of the ecological crisis, because ultimately the ecological crisis finds its roots in our own disordered attitudes, what we might call a kind of polluted interior ecology. And here, I think a daily exam is a good practice, and I have um, prepared one based on Laudato Si and the ecology of daily life, and I have some cards, uh, prayer cards out there if any of you would like to take them home. It's, it's a kind of helpful practice, spiritual practice, to get to those interior roots. Then after we, we search our interior lives, we come to chapter four and the, the keystone of the whole encyclical, the notion of integral ecology, which is the marriage of natural and human ecology. And I think the Pope's answer to the ecological crisis is basically finding ways to practice integral ecology. That's what he wants us to do. Some of these will be macro solutions. So in chapter five, that would be initiatives in politics and economics. And here I think of the impressive work that, that Father Jenkins has done with Dr. Leo Burke and Carolyn Wu in setting up a dialogue between top energy executives and the Vatican. Or they might be micro solutions, as in chapter six, in terms of ecological education and spirituality, which we, re we really need to do at all levels of Catholic education. 
And my concluding reflection will suggest a few ideas for ecological education and spirituality moving forward. So the very organization of the encyclical is an example of putting small C foundations into action. It's a model of kind of like universal and dialogical Catholic approach to the ecological crisis. Chapter one, I just wanted to mention here, these are the four issues mentioned in chapter one, and they, you could look at them as kind of a contemporary research platform for the sciences in relation to Laudato Si. So work on climate change, pollution, water issues, and biodiversity, huge areas of need for all of humanity. Work on them in the spirit of sound science, but also looking for solutions that are integral that benefit both the natural and the human ecology. And I read on your website about Dr. Rohr's research on schistosomiasis and waterways in Senegal, a beautiful research. And I was particularly struck by the attentiveness of Dr. Rohr and his research team, not only to the science, getting to the causes of the pollution, but seeking solutions attuned to the science that at the same time are in dialogue with the local villagers. And I think this is a fine example of science and integral ecology in action. Now, in the theology, there's, there's a lot we could say here, um, and Pope Francis doesn't shy away at all from introducing principles of Catholic theology in a spirit of dialogue and showing how they can be of service to the global dialogue around questions of sustainability. And I should just mention the photos now, from now until the end of the presentation, are taken from our land in Michigan, where we live, and I thought I might just share some of that place with you. There's, I would just like to focus on one paragraph in chapter two, Number 66, the creation account suggests that human life is grounded in three fundamental and closely intertwined relationships with God, with our neighbor, and with the earth itself. So integral ecology is about building and nourishing those relationships. And sin is about the places and ways in which those relationships have been ruptured or their interconnections severed or their integrity marred or polluted. St. Bonaventure, the great Franciscan, I have to get one Franciscan in tonight. Um, he says that sin muddies our eyes so we can't see clearly. Sin, sin con confounds. The subtitle of Laudato Si is care for creation, and the use of the word care is, is very purposeful. It's more than stewardship. Stewardship is good, but it implies a relationship based on duty, while when you care for something, it's something you do with passion and love. And so I think the Pope's message of integral ecology in Laudato Si is an invitation to make our love for God show in how we care for others and how we care for the earth. So how do we live this kind of integral ecology? And I think one way to think about it is that we need both the small C and the capital C foundations. We need the science, the small C spirit of dialogue and friendship, and we need the theology, the, the capital C foundational principles. And the two, of, the two capital C principles that I'd like to focus on tonight that I think are especially applicable and important for integral ecology are the, what creation is and the distinction between creation and nature, and then secondly, who we are as humans and what our role is in the created world. Oops, sorry. We have chickens and beef, and you can see them there. On the first question, what is creation? I tell my students that creation is actually a theological term, properly speaking. And it's not the same as nature, even though the two, th the two terms are often conflated in our day, just as they were in Father Zahm's day. Pope Francis himself makes this distinction clear in Laudato Si in paragraph 76. He writes, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, the word creation has a broader meaning than nature, for it has to do with God's loving plan in which every creature has its own value and significance. Nature is usually seen as a system which can be studied, understood, and controlled, whereas creation can only be understood as a gift from the outstretched hand of the Father of all and as a reality illuminated by love which calls us together into universal communion. Creation is of the order of love. On the other hand, he says in paragraph 115, 
The technological mind sees nature as an insensate order, as a cold body of facts, an object of utility, as raw material to be hammered into shape. And when we instrumentalize creation in this way, the intrinsic goodness of the created world is compromised. One final point here about the distinctiveness of Judeo-Christian thought about creation. The Genesis creation stories were revolutionary in their day because they depicted a Jewish God who created the world according to a logical, orderly pattern in which he pronounced all as good. Very unlike the concurrent pagan creation stories like those of the Babylonians, in which nature was divine and humans were created from the blood of warring deities that inhabited different aspects of the natural world. So in essence, the Judeo-Christian thought demythologized nature. And this demythologizing is a positive thing because for one, it allowed for the conception of rational pursuits like science. But we also need to guard against the objectifying of nature that can, could arise from demythologizing it. Many Catholic thinkers have called creation a book. And Laudato Si says this, that God has written a precious book whose letters are the multitude of created things present in the universe. Creation is a constant source of wonder and awe from which no creature is excluded. It's also a continuing revelation of the divine. And St. Bonaventure would say that the vestiges of God are imprinted on creation like footprints, beckoning us to look beyond them to the author of the footprints, who made those footprints, beckoning us basically from secondary causes to the primary cause. So if creation is a book that is constantly speaking to us, we need to learn to listen to its message. In short, we need to learn to read the book of creation and to teach others how to do that. So now to the second capital C principle, who are we as humans? I thought it would be helpful that if we start with who we're not. And the Pope is very clear in Laudato Si that, that there can be no ecology without an adequate anthropology. So it's critical that we get our anthropology right. So who are we not? First of all, we're not God. When we forget God or push him out of the picture, we end up usurping his place and refusing to acknowledge our own creaturely limitations. And this can lead us to impose ourselves on reality and kind of claim it as our own, to exercise a kind of absolute domination over other creatures. And when we do this, we do tend to objectify creation, to ignore its intrinsic goodness, and reduce it to its instrumental use. I couldn't help but think this recently when a priest in Indiana who had visited a large dairy farm was, was telling me about his struggle with how the animals were treated like machines in a factory and totally instrumentalized, and he was really saddened by it. The sad thing, too, is when we treat creation this way, we tend to objectify humans also. It becomes a part of our inner ecology, in a way. Pope Francis stresses in Laudato Si that we should never reduce humans to the status of an object. Humans are subjects. And objectifying others using them is an example of what Pope Francis calls misguided anthropocentrism, which he identifies in Chapter 3 as one of the two taproots of the ecological crisis. There are two extremes to this misguided anthro anthropocentrism. At one extreme is this position of total hubris and domination that we've been talking about. At the other extreme is a kind of divinization of the earth and a leveling of humans to the same level as other creatures. And Pope Francis does emphasize in Laudato Si that we're not just one being among others. A little tongue-in-cheek here, we, as Franciscans, we love our animals, and especially our dogs, though we, we try to keep that in balance. But nevertheless, some of our friends have teased that they would love to come back as a Franciscan dog in another life. <laughs> so this comic made me smile. The two dogs preparing for tax day, and the one behind the desk is saying to the other, I realize how helpless and needy they are, but I'm afraid you still can't claim a human as a dependent. <laughs> And just go for good measure, here's one of our dogs, Boston, <laughs> of whom I'm particularly fond, looking completely nonplussed by my human attentions. But on a serious note, while we, we seek to be in communion with all creatures, 
as humans, we need to be careful not to deny our unique role and responsibility in the created world. The Pope says that at times we see an obsession with denying any preeminence to the human person. But this, he says, deprives human beings of their unique worth and the responsibility it entails. In effect, denying human uniqueness ends up creating new imbalances which would deflect us from the reality which challenges us. So beautifully said. And then fi one final point about who we are not. We're not meant to be alone. We're fundamentally relational creatures meant to be in communion with God, with one another, and with the rest of creation. And then who we are. So, and we've learned a lot by looking at who we're not. We do have a kind of nobility in the best sense, an immense dignity, which is conferred upon us at conception and which we share with all human persons, regardless of race, disability, creed, or religion, because we're created uniquely in the image and likeness of God, in God's love. And as the Catholic Catechism tells us, each human person is not just something, but someone, a subject possessing a natural material body with certain laws written within it that inscribe within us a kind of inner moral structure. And so consistent with Father Zahm's assertion of human uniqueness, Pope Francis says that human beings, even if we postulate a process of evolution, also possess a uniqueness which cannot be fully explained by evolution of other open systems. Each of us has his own personal identity and is capable of entering into dialogue with others and with God himself. And our capacity to reason, to develop arguments, to be inventive, to interpret reality and to create art, they're all signs of a uniqueness which transcends the spheres of physics and biology. And it's all about each of us is a thou capable of knowing, loving, and entering into dialogue with another thou, another person who is another thou. So basically for the Pope, our relationship with, creation, with the non-human creation can never be isolated from our relationship with others and from, with God. And this is the key to integral ecology from a Catholic perspective and to staying true to who we are called to be as humans. So what, what is our unique role? Laudato Si tells us that our human vocation is to be cooperators with God in the work of creation a role with great responsibility, not to mention the potential for tremendous pitfalls, the manifestations of which we see around us in the many forms of ecological and social degradation plaguing us today. The challenge is to shape our actions so that they become ones of receptivity, dialogue, cooperation with God and with the rhythms he's inscribed in the book of nature. So rather than dominating or disobeying those laws, or on the other side, abnegating responsibility and withdrawing from our special role by reducing ourselves to just another creature. We need a way in the middle, and getting our role right is really critical. Genesis tells us that we are called to till and keep the garden of the world. So tilling refers to cultivating, generating produce, and these are some of the fruits of the work of our hands, our canning and our eggs from our laying hens. We're also called not just to till, but to keep, which means caring, protecting, overseeing, and preserving. And it, it implies, I think, keeping implies a relation of mutuality between humans and the rest of creation. When we grow in our capacity for this kind of relationship, we also ennoble ourselves in that pursuit. And it's a, it's a mutual ennobling. In order to do this well, we need to approach the world with what Pope Francis calls serene attentiveness. And I think scientists should have this posture in their research. It helps us to learn uh, more about creation, to listen and understand it more deeply, and to learn to care for it. It's, it's one of our three prime relationships, and so it deserves that kind of attentiveness. In my classes, I often give my students the assignment to spend a, a prescribed amount of time in a spa an outdoor setting that they really respond to and to journal their thoughts there throughout the semester. And it's often quite um, enlightening and beautiful to read their journals and the fruit of that contemplative time. Ultimately, we are called as humans to lead all creatures back to their creator, 
very Franciscan. So just as we humans have a transcendent destiny, so does the rest of creation, says the Pope. And just as we are to help each other get to heaven, we are also to help creation, species by species, ecosystem by ecosystem, into what Pope Francis calls its transcendent fullness, where the risen Christ embraces all things. So now for my concluding reflection, in the spirit of chapter six of Laudato Si, I'd like to suggest a couple of creative projections for how those two capital C foundational principles might be incorporated into new programs of ecological education and spirituality. So first, I think we need strong and attractive images of who the person, human person is and what our role is. Images that highlight and enhance our unique gifts while at the same time kind of cutting across that old image of domination. And one image that I've been working on for the past couple of years I think is particularly compelling is that of the human person as gardener. We do a lot of gardening as Franciscans, so this one comes kind of naturally. Secondly, if we are gardeners and we're tilling and ke keeping creation in the spirit of serene attentiveness that the encyclical is calling for, what messages are we hearing from creation and how can we share those messages with others? I love this image of the human person as gardener in this painting by Jules Breton. It's called The Song of the Lark. And the woman gardener embodies a spirit of serene attentiveness in her, her humble, receptive posture, listening to the lark as she heads out with her side to begin harvesting, her feet bare in touch with the soil, the sun rising behind her as she greets the day. And I think this image of the human person as gardener is a particularly powerful one from both a theological and a kind of practical and scientific perspective. In Genesis, we're commissioned to garden the earth and are entrusted with the mission to care for it and help bring forth its fruitfulness. We're the only creatures that can truly garden. And in doing so, if we garden well, we, we ennoble the created world. We bring out its beauty and fruitfulness. And uh, we then ennoble ourselves as well. Make no mistake, this isn't easy. As a gardener and in a community of sisters who garden, we know this firsthand as we, and we really work hard on the land and the challenges that arise. But not only is that a powerful image in Genesis, it's also a concrete practical image and one that I think could lead to impactful practices in integral ecology. One of the especially fascinating areas of ecological work currently is in regenerative agriculture, which is exploring practices for growing food that not only benefit the natural ecology of the farms, the human ecology of the farmers, but were also hi highly effective in capturing carbon. And I'd like to show a short trailer from an interesting film called Kiss the Earth, which gives a, a hint of what I'm speaking of here. There's so much bad news about our planet, and it's so overwhelming. Truth is, I've given up. This is the story of a simple solution, a way to heal our planet. The solution is right under our feet, and it's as old as dirt. All of our soils that are under chemical conventional agriculture are almost completely devoid of microorganisms. Modern agriculture was not designed for the betterment of the soil. Fossil fuels are by no means the only thing that is causing climate change. When we damage soils, carbon goes back to the atmosphere. But when we destroy soil, it releases carbon dioxide. Biosequestration is using plants, trees, and techniques of grazing and farming to capture carbon and store it in the soil. We can fix a lot of our climate issues if we bring the CO2 down into a living plant and put it back into the soil where it belongs. Plants working with soil microorganisms, it seems too simple. Healthy soils lead to a healthy plant. Healthy plant, healthy human, healthy climate. There could be a way to eat food that heals the planet. The problem isn't the animal. The problem is where the animals are at. How do we take waste and repurpose and reuse it because it's really not waste? The poop has to stay in the loop. Compost is just one of a suite of soil-based carbon capture solutions. 
we know how to do it. And if we continue to scale over 30 years, we can reverse global warming. We can get the Earth back to the Garden of Eden that it once was by regeneration. To see biodiversity return to a place that was completely devastated, that gives me hope. Our health and the health of our planet are connected. If you look over here, my neighbor's land that has been chemical fallow, then you look over at our paddock, you have a diversity of different plant species. Which model do you want your food to be produced from? The answer is pretty simple to me. I'll make you a deal. I won't give up, and neither should you. I think a really interesting approach that holds some promise for future explore, exploration. Now, so and what? So, are, are we listening to the message of creation, and and how can we share it with others, and in some uniquely Catholic ways, perhaps? This summer, while I was preparing for my undergrad intro to environmental science course for this semester, I had a kind of aha moment when I realized that so much in nature is about eating or being eaten, and. <laughs> It really is, and, and then it hit me, what is that but a sacramental message? As Catholics, as Eucharistic people, we should understand this like no others. All of creation is a shadow, a vestige of the Eucharist, we might say. One level of life laying down as life so another can survive. There's a Christian philosopher, Holmes Rolston, who speaks of a crucifarm or kenotic creation, and I think I like that image. But why not also call it a Eucharistic or a pre-Eucharistic creation? It's around us everywhere. Every food web, every predator-prey relationship, every gardening relationship, it's all about eating. And it's not a meager meal. It's all about Eucharistic extravagance. So if we could allow creation to speak, I suggest that we might think of two future trajectories for ecological education and spirituality. And again, one kind of practical and one more spiritual. First, on a practical level, the importance of practicing gardening, especially regenerative agriculture and various soil practices for, for carbon capture. Perhaps universities can begin to do this on their lands, parishes as well. We might want to look at collaborations for this on our church lands or with Catholic farmers or with the Catholic rural life movement in consultation with, with universities. And then on the, the more spiritual side, the Book of Creation may be pointing us as Catholics to the need for deeper Eucharistic reflection and catechesis on the Eucharist. A catechesis that begins with sharing this, this sacramental, this pre-Eucharistic nature of creation that is written in the very structures of the world around us. And so I'd like to close my comments tonight with a kind of prayer reflection along these lines that I was inspired to write as I thought about sharing the message of creation with others. And I was struck today at Mass when the, the hymn, the communion hymn was Take and Eat, this is my body, and this is, these are the words with which I'll be closing in my prayer reflection. So take and eat, this is my body given for you. Take, not in a rapacious spirit with grabbing hands, no, take with open hands and a receptive heart in a small sea spirit of encounter, receiving the gift of love offered, receiving so thoroughly as to eat, wheat and grapes grown, gardened by humans' hands and substance transformed, taking within and allowing the substance of bread to become part of our bodies and our souls, matter and spirit transformed, transubstantiated, into the gift given, into body given, and eat, incorporating in the true sense of forming into our own bodies the body of Christ laid down in love for all of us and becoming Christ for others. This, this matter, not brute, debased matter, no, this embodied matter, both physical and spiritual, imbued with the transcendent, this matter which is Christ's body, my body, he says, raised on the cross of personal and universal suffering, laid down as a gift of sacrificial love given over for us. 
cruciform matter, sacramental matter, Eucharistic extravagance ennobling matter, ennobling human lives to be gardened through integral ecology and offered to Christ. Eucharistic extravagance, the mystery and heart of truly integral ecology, the restoration and entrusting of the universe into the embrace of the risen Christ who ennobles all things. So thank you, I think I can. I understand we have some time for questions and there are people with microphones so they asked if you would walk over to a microphone if you have a question or a comment. Sister Damien Marie, yeah. um, wonderful to see you again. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is really wonderful, and it, it, it reminds me of the time that we uh, spent, spent in Houston, St. Thomas. It, so I want to uh, say that um, the themes that you uh, uh, hit upon correctly, uh, in, in my view, just spot on. Uh, the issue of creation as opposed to nature. The issue of the centrality of uh, anthropology, understanding human nature correctly, um, the the notion of tilling and keeping, uh, and uh, implicit stewardship, uh, the sense of sacramentality uh, that you that you ended with, and if I may say, and I, I don't think this is something that you necessarily haven't thought about or, or wouldn't think about, but I, but if I would say if if there was one thing lacking, um, it would be a theory of urbanism. Yeah. Um, because the trajectory of the, the, you know, of the Christian narrative is from a garden to a city, mm -hmm. to, to, the new to the New Jerusalem, to the city of God. And um, so thinking about this, um, there, you know, Augustine juxtaposes the city of God and the city of man. Uh, and he talks about how they intersect and how they, you know, also, and how they, uh, I think, in, I think the, the notion of sacramentality is actually uh, really central to this, but he also um, discusses how the city of man is set in opposition to the city of God, which I think is uh, a, a, an implicit theme, I think, of, of Laudato Si, the ways in which uh, human beings as artisans, we've created cities, we've, we've created uh, uh, patterns of agriculture that set themselves against nature and against mm -hmm. our own fulfillment and and care for the earth, and so um, I just I just um, would want to say that uh, um, part of what we should be doing I think is as uh, Catholics uh, that that needs to be an important part of the way that we think about what it means to to flourish, what it means to be good stewards, um, what it means to be faithful disciples, uh, to think about as well about how cities and nature, how, how human beings are a kind of animal who naturally make cities. So how should we make them? Yeah, and so great point. Thank you, Dr. Bess. Um, yeah, and so I was more focusing perhaps more on the, the agriculture, the end of things. But basically, I think we need to design our buildings according to the message of nature. So I've been working on this science building at Aquinas that I was charged with getting built during my tenure there as dean. And we just got our LEED Gold certification, thank the Lord. <laughs> um, and, but you know what? It makes the building a better building. I'm fully convinced because it is a wonderful building to work in. There's a lot of fresh air flow through. During COVID, we didn't have to change all the filters because we had so much fresh air return. There's a lot of natural light. We rarely have to turn on our lights. I hardly ever turn on my light in my office, even in the classrooms. So, um, and that's just a small, I mean, a tiny, a tiny portion of the message of nature that we're trying to work with. But I think we could do much better with designing our buildings and our cities according to the laws of nature, according to the grammar of nature. Um, and it would be neat to see architects kind of working with that, those concepts, you know, and doing, so just as we're trying to listen to nature and move away from industrial agriculture, could we kind of move away from industrial building too, <laughs> you know, and d design more natural buildings. So it's a great point, thank you. Oh. 
Um, I just wanted to say that was an amazing uh, sort of expository uh, lecture Great. given. Great. I'm glad. Thank Massive you. kudos to you. Really uh, done a lot of research, and it was very, very well conveyed. Um, that was actually a very interesting point on the subject of urbanization uh, that was sort of brought up. But one other thing that I was thinking about throughout uh, the presentation was uh, the implications of the creation mandate. And he sort of touched up upon it, saying that, you know, humans uh, have an inclination to, uh, to multiply. It's even, you know, stated in the Bible, uh, be fruitful and multiply. And this can spill over into the agricultural uh, sect, uh, to say the least. And this uh, will most likely result in mass agriculture, mass crop growing. And one of the most uh, important things is keeping those crops alive. So given, you know, pesticides and GMOs, um, do you believe that pesticides are a worse alternative to GMOs? Or w what are your stances on this sort of uh, policy? And if you could give any maybe other alternatives that aren't uh, as well known? Yeah. So. No, I, I, I'm, I'm not trying to say that any of this is easy or that a transition would be easy. And certainly when we're trying to grow food for a lot of people, and I know it myself too, you know, when the Japanese beetles are infesting the grapes, I'm like, I'm going to kill those things, you know. <laughs> and it, it, you just want to go out there and spray something really nasty on there. So it's a, it's, a, a real, it's a real human struggle that we go through. But having said that, I just feel, I feel strongly that we need to move away from pesticides. And I, you know, because they're actually, at the, we're at the point now where not only the effects of the toxins, but the effects on the soils and the microorganisms are actually impeding the level of fertility. So the, and, and the amount of nutrition we're getting from our crops now is actually far less than it was in the 1950s. And there's documentation on that in terms of the, the major nutrients. They're, they're less because the soils are not as fertile as they once were because the soil microorganisms, the whole soil ecosystem isn't as healthy as it once was because of the toxins that are being put on it. I do think, it, and um, I really appreciated your question, and it, you had told me at the beginning that you're a freshman here, and political science major, I think you said? Uh, yes, political science and uh, voice. <laughs> and voice, okay, so music. Um, but I think it's wonderful that you're thinking about these things because if you go on in political science or law, these are the kinds of policies that we're going to need to think of. But regenerative agriculture really shows a lot of promise for, for farming on large scale while at the same time restoring the soil and then not only that, but capturing carbon. So I would suggest if you would wanted to read a little bit more about regenerative agriculture it, and not using GMOs also. In Europe, they don't use GMOs and they're still managing to provide for their, for their people. But I think regenerative agriculture has a lot of potential for the future, the more we see farmers, but it takes a risk. And when in that film, the farmer who speaks at the end, he recounts his story of having to switch over from industrial to regenerative farming, and the, the fear, because it was everything he knew in his life, and he was completely s changing to a new way of farming. But now he's actually doing very well financially, and his land is healthier. So the fear patterns will be really difficult <laughs> when we, if we want to do this on a large scale. But I think if universities became involved and it kind of got a more of a groundswell and a research base, that it might have potential. And also with the carbon capture, it's very promising. So. Thank you, sister, for a very inspiring <laughs> lecture, oh, which I think explains something that is not well understood for us locally here about Zam, which is the nature of his fascination and the way that he was drawn to Dante's Divine Comedy, because it expresses exactly that theory of creation, the relationship between creation and nature that that you so beautifully mm, that's uh, beautiful. delineated and 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 so Zam when he read the divine comedy he must have just completely channeled that 
into, it's completely consistent with his perspective on evolution, the relationship between science and sacred knowledge, theology. That is really inspiring. But, it's really neat to hear that. So I, I wanted to ask, of course, Laudato Si is from a poem. It's a title of a poem yeah. of uh, St. Francis. And so I wondered if you would talk a little bit about the, the importance and the role of poetry and art as part of this broader picture of confronting, addressing the challenges that we face in this respect. Okay, wonderful question. Wow, um, and I love this interdisciplinary dialogue. Now, I'm not trained in these areas, but I, do, I did find, even with when I saw Jules Breton's um, painting, which is in the Chicago Institute of Art, I think, I was just taken by it, and it's like sometimes an image in a poem or in art can speak more than words or can complement what the words are saying or can it's easier for people to understand or, or grasp the depth of it when there's some kind of artistic representation so i think we we probably need to we need to work more with that and i know even in teaching science we often try to use images that are that are instructive and sometimes there are even like art images like some of the fractals and all of that to try and explain those theories, it does really help to look at the images. Um, so probably what you're pointing to is uh, a need for that much more interdisciplinary collaboration. Uh, but yeah, the image is so, creating images is so strong right now, and I think we need to do that in this culture. Because words only go so far, and also they, sometimes they get polarized, and image seems to get to kind of the core concept, so. But thank you for that comment about Dante. I just thought that was beautiful, really divine. Sorry to go back to the farm, sister, but um, oh, given where we are and the beautiful <laughs> um, picture of the farm and being the gardener, I, yeah. I grew up in a, an agricultural community of family farms. And um, when you're, you mentioned the priest saying to you how he was concerned about how the animals were kept, I do wonder, and I'm going to look for that kiss the earth, whether there are any extrapolations saying that by going to this other mode, we can produce enough food for the billions of people. Yeah, and that's, I mean, I don't think we know yet. We don't know yet, and that's the key. That's a key question. However, if we could also, we could do a lot better by producing food closer to home, <laughs> which I think is, would be a huge improvement. Um, that would certainly change economies, though, too. And I'm, I'm not an economist, so I, this is where we need other people in the dialogue, so there would be certainly economic implications. But I would see it as a positive. Maybe we wouldn't notice it so much here in the United States, but so many countries who are struggling to eat, if they could do this in local regions so they could feed themselves, I think would be huge. So maybe we need to even move aw away from how we think about it, like one place growing for to be shipped all over the world as opposed to growing things closer to home, closer to the local. But it's a, it's a very good question that you have. I would say the other issue, of course, is you know, the, the elements that God gives us, and one of them, of course, is water. And it doesn't matter what you put in the ground, if you don't have water, it's not gonna grow. So I know that you're, uh, is there more information about, you, you talked about um, restoring water quality and yeah, and that's a, that's a huge issue because of you know we're drawing down our aquifers and um, huge issue, and we'll be switching over to dry land farming in the central part of the country, Oklahoma and places like that, because of the Ogallala Aquifer kind of being overextended. Uh, so we may have to change how we garden. But one thing you do find with this regenerative agriculture, so a lot of it you keep cover on the soil at all times. You don't leave the soil open and it actually really improves water retention because the, the plants themselves maintain the water flow. So it's much, and it requires less watering. So that might be, you know, that would certainly be a help with the water issues. But yeah, thank you. Sister, I am going to uh, thank you and thank everyone for joining us. Uh, remarkable talk. You've combined 
It's history, science, theology, and dogma, art in uh, Dante, and, and a deep call to spiritual regeneration. For, so we can't thank you enough for this wonderful presentation. I have a little presentation for you. <laughs> This is just a memento of, oh of your visit with us, of oh. our, our poster. And please, um, please use it to remind uh, you of your visit here and to remind you that you're always welcome at Notre Dame. Oh, thank you. Thank yes. you so much, Father. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for attending. <laughs>